a homily for the fifth Sunday of Easter. It is necessary for us to undergo many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, St. Paul says in our first reading. And, we might add, we will undergo many hardships just to maintain our sanity, given life in the church and in our country today. All human beings live at the edge of the precipice. Some of us stand at the edge in lives that offer us some comfort and peace. But as we look over the precipice, we look into a dark abyss of terrible evils that human frailties have wrought, where many human beings have fallen and are falling. So fear, fear of falling, fear of fear, is the great killer. We must engage the fear, hear Jesus' repeated words, do not be afraid, let the fear go, and move forward courageously. With all the fear in our world, no wonder people with secular mindsets anesthetize themselves with toys and chemicals. No wonder others turn to a fantasy world of good people and enemies, where the enemy is always them, and the good people are always us. And some people add a theological claim. God is on our side and against them. At their best, religion, theology, and spirituality show us what is good, how we can navigate the not good to enter more deeply into the good, which is God, and so find meaning and joy in life. Unfortunately, even religion, theology, and spirituality can be manipulated to meet personal needs and even evil ends. How do human beings go so quickly astray? One factor, I think, is the gravitational pull of ego. God gives us egos as a gift that, properly nourished, direct us to the good inside us and beyond us, to love in relationship. And yet, the undernourished ego, the unnourished ego, suffers a gnawing ache, a superating fear that demands affirmation and clarity as a bulwark against life's antagonisms and complexities. Once egos begin to clamor for affirmation and clarity, fear of receiving neither increases and the troubles begin. Some human beings seek relief from the ache of life's complexities in a retrospective longing for what seems, in hindsight, to be a golden age when life was simpler and answers clearer. Some Catholics long for the idealized, authoritative, and authoritarian church of the high Middle Ages, with its Latin mass, abstract philosophy, and ahistorical theology that provided clear answers to all life's questions. This conception of church, this ecclesiology, is called integralism, and it believes that church authority and teaching supersede all secular governance and government. So, in 1208, Pope Innocent III put all of England under interdict for six years because King John rejected the Pope's appointee as Archbishop of Canterbury. After Cardinal Law resigned in December 2002, he took up positions of authority in Rome, and in May 2004, John Paul made him Archpriest of St. Mary Major Basilica. The message is clear. U.S. civil authority was secondary to that of church, Catholic churchmen, and I do mean men. This ecclesiology it may impose order, which for some may relieve fear and uncertainty, but it raises the question of who will guard the guards. 
as the hierarchy's recent failures demonstrate. Another ecclesiology of modern Catholicism is called intransigentism, and it advocates the same abstract ahistorical theology of the medieval authoritarian church, and therefore rejects the social and intellectual advancements of the last two centuries. These advancements recognize human experience as a locus of God's revelation, and psychology as a source of knowledge about the human person, and both as a source of moral understanding. The fullness of truth, this ecclesiology claims, has been revealed to the hierarchy, and human concepts, including democracy and religious liberty, have no place in the religious order. Vatican II challenged these ecclesiologies, directed the Church's energies outward into the world, and so invited the Church to embrace life in all its complexity as the engine of our own growth and the healing of the world's suffering. This engagement with the complexity of life seems to me the only route develop to developing mature human beings in mature institutions who can bring mature love to the world. Such an embrace, though, produces in individuals and institutions both the fear of the unknown as well as the exhilaration of discovery and growth. And we must not underestimate the amount of fear that bubbles up, nor can we underestimate the excesses that can emerge when traditional strictures are loosened, as after Vatican II. Advocates of tradition, after all, may well be reacting not only to what might happen, but also to what is actually happening that is, in fact, excessive. Jesus calls us all to moderation and to humility. I see this same pattern at work in the theory of originalism that wants to interpret the U.S. Constitution by attempting to descry the intent of the original drafters. Judge Alito, in the recent document leak, for example, asserts that the Constitution makes no reference to abortion, and that abortion, therefore, cannot claim constitutional protection. It is, of course, true that the Constitution does not mention abortion. The Constitution does not mention many of the realities of contemporary American life, nor does it address the concerns of women, nor of men owning no property, nor slaves, nor native peoples, all of whom were legally invisible at the time. So in the absence of such references, how does the law speak to today's civil needs? It cannot, without an interpretation of the text that takes the present day's needs seriously. In the face of this darkness, our second reading offers us God's vision for us all. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. God will dwell with them and they will be God's people. God will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death or mourning, no wailing, no pain, for the old order has passed away. In the Gospel, Jesus reminds us that love is the key. Deciding to love and choosing not to be afraid are Jesus' key directives in the face of that which threatens us. Jesus asks us to remember that he is the source of meaning, significance, and value in life, no matter what evil befalls us. Jesus asks us to engage without fear, no matter the cost, trusting that he will lead us through. These invitations challenge us to the core of our beings, where his love abides right next to our fear. As we engage his love, the love casts out the fear, and then, as fear recedes, hope can take its place. 
let's accept this invitation today as our safeguard against the abyss and move forward in faith and love.